Shalom, Chavarim, Shalom. Let's address right here the fall of man, what is called theologically in Judeo-Christian circles as the fall of man or the fall of Adam and the rise of the matriarchy after the beginning. That's how I want to start it out, after the beginning. In the beginning, there was balance, but there's the fall of man, what's traditionally, according to Christianity, and even to some degree in um, Judaic circles, what it, we have in the first um, third, the third chapter, you know, in the first couple of chapters of Bereshith, as his Hebrew, Hebrew name is known as Bereshith. So I want to really address the matriarchy because we hear people talk about patriarchy and a patriarchal society and down with the patriarchy and the so-called big bad patriarchy. And we're not saying that the patriarchy does not have much to account for. I mean, even in the scripture, the 10, the ten um, words, the Esaret de Barim, known as the Ten Commandments, it says, I will visit the iniquity of the fathers specifically the fathers upon the sons to the third and fourth generation. The King James translation says children, but if you study that in the Hebrew, you'll see that's being addressed to call Yisrael, to the Bnei Yisrael, to Yasharala, to Israel as a male. Now, what's interesting in the scripts, we have the male aspect and the female aspect throughout the scripts in the afro Asiatic, Afro-Semitic, I like to say Ethio, Ethio-Semitic languages and the linguistics of the language, the Hebrew, and in the other, we say Ethio-Semitic languages, we have the male and the female. In English, that gets covered up a lot by it. And a lot of the translators say it, it here and it there. And what's covered up is the divine double helix, the male and the female, what we can call the divine binary system. I know there's a lot of talk against binary and one speak about fluidity, fluidity, understandable in scientific terms, but let's recognize that even the technology that we have, it functions on what we know as a binary system, like a one and a zero, almost like male and female. You know, we could say the so-called positives and negatives when we're speaking scientifically not according to certain moral theology, but according to science. So the beginning of the matrix, <laughs> I said matrix, yeah, the beginning of the matriarchy, right? The beginning of the matriarchy was after, we said the rise of the matriarchy. And we said the rise of the matriarchy, we're not putting this in the conventional kind of Western Gentile romanticism that the patriarchy is woo, 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 is bad in all its ways and it's all its forms and the matriarchy is always good. This is a, a severe ignorance of the first times, the f severe ignorance of what is known as the ancient times. And this ignorance is because of this Western Gentile counterfeit Christian, the inferiority posing as supremacy and other thoughts and calcified pineal gland mentality being superimposed over this so-called biblical or scriptural, which is much deeper than the translations, right? And much deeper than the various different versions and perversions of what's known as the so-called Judeo-Christian, you know, or Christianity, so forth and so on. So the first thing we want to address right here is to bring some, some proofs to bear of what we're saying right here, that the rise of the matriarchy is thousands of years old. We've been under matriarchal systems and in some ways we may still be in a kind of a matriarchal system even today. I will use other language, but I don't want to get into other kind of areas. You know, it's somewhat of a, it, 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 it has a trans, um, a transitory nature, if you understand where I'm pointing to, without getting into that whole conversation, because we even have that as a big issue today, because the beginning, you know, the ancient world has been misconceptualized. We've been told that it's always been a patriarchy, but that's not what the Bible says, right? For example, let's show this right here. Let's show this right here. Let's bring this up, our first exhibit and our main exhibit. We have Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, right? Bereshith in the Hebrew. Bereshith. 
Some interpret that as in the beginning. More correctly, bereshis, in reishis, in wisdom. Wisdom Hebraically is feminine. Right? It's a feminine principle. We could say of the Almighty, of the Supreme, of we could say He who be, who He be. Now, of course, some will say the He there, but if we look at this scientifically, we have the X X and the X Y. So that's the whole as above, so below. But here in this particular verse, we have Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, and Adam. Now remember, Genesis chapter 3, verse 20 is after what is known in um, theological circles, Western Gentile theological circles, as the fall of man or the fall of Adam. This regards the incident that occurs in the third chapter regarding the serpent, the Nahash, regarding the, the Isha, right? the Eshet, the Oset, the woman, and regarding Adam, Aleph Dam, first blood, or the man named Adam. Right? And in that particular chapter regarding the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and so forth and so on, the, that incident in the true ancient Hebrew perspective has little to nothing do, to do with the way many of us believe, you know, what is going on or, or have been made to believe, especially through Christianity, you know, how to interpret that. First of all, the woman Right, was in transgression, but the man was in gross disobedience. Right? The man, both of them were, you could say, wrong, right? But the man's wrong outweighs the woman's wrong. Now, this is definitely not what has been taught by Christianity. We're taught that, well, the reason why the world is the way it is is because of the woman. The woman ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The woman, the woman, the woman. But that is a counterfeit, a contrary, a counterfeit interpretation of the facts as they are laid out here in the Hebrew and from the Hebrew mind. And it was the Western Gentile mind had failed to grasp the gravity of this. And if they have, they have kept this very much hidden from the majority of the public so they can continue the deception that is pointed out even in this third chapter. But by the time we get to verse 20, where it says, and Adam called his wife's name, his Isha, his Eshet, his Oset's name, Hawa, right? We have Hawa, right? Hava, Hawa, right? Which means life, has related, it's related to life. Let's just bring that up here so one can see that, right? Hawa, they said the first woman, right? Hawa, life giver, we get to the root right here. We have Hawa. We have Hava, Hawa, right? To do what? To tell, to declare, to show, to make known. The secondary meaning is breath, to breathe, right? The primitive root, you see the primitive root to live. By implication, is to declare, to show. Now, there's two words to be compared right here. One is Hawa, Hawa, to show, to interpret, to explain, to inform, to tell, to declare, Right, Hawa, looking at the root of Eve's name in the Hebrew. Then we have over here the second word right here from the H2421. We have Chaya, Chaya, Chaya. Now in Chaya, we have to live, have life, remain alive, sustain life, live prosperous, prosperously, live forever, be quickened, right? Be alive, be restored to life or health. And you can see the various different forms of this word has to do with life and living, right? Life and living. Let's scroll down right here to the Strong's to live, right? Whether literally, according to the letter, or figuratively, according to the spirit, whether literally, according to the physical, or whether figuratively, according to the metaphysical. This is the beauty of the Ethio-Semitic Right, we could say the Afro Semitic linguistics and languages. Right, in one word, it has the two sides. Right, and the key for interpretation is the spirit. Right, those who are only able to see and receive the letter of the law, here's where we get the counterfeit Christian interpretations, and here's where we get the cover up of the matriarchy in the beginning. The matriarchy has been in existence for a very long time. In fact, even today, the matriarchy is still in existence. The so-called 
the white patriarchy as it's known, and, and we have to identify it as the white patriarchy. The present patriarchy is the white patriarchy, like the present pseudo-supremacy is a so-called white supremacy. The privilege is a so-called pseudo-white privilege, if we just are going to put it, you know, and keep it a buck right there. But this verse here, let's get back to this verse, Genesis 3 and 20. It says, because, so Adam called his wife's name, right, Hawa. Right? Because she was the mother of all living. Let's pause here for a moment. My question is, according to the narrative, how could his wife, according to the narrative that was brought forward or that was created, that was that was built, as the Hebrew brings out, from the, the so-called rib, which looking at the science of the scriptures, we're looking at the DNA, we're looking at chromosomal science. How do they know? Could they have known way back then about chromosomes? My question is that what we call chromosomes, did they exist? Did they exist way back then? So how are we to assume that people way back then did not know? You see that pride of this latter day and time that didn't know, right, about much things from the ancient past, but as we study the ancient past, it seems like they had more science and technology in the ancient past than we have today. And what we have today obviously has been reverse engineered, right? Not so much alien, right? In the alien sense, but alien, alien to this Western Gentile world. Just like what we're about to say right here and what we're saying here is also alien to the conventional thought that what the matriarchy existed and was in effect and was in, in the rise. The rise of the matriarchy begins at this particular verse right here. Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. Because Adam calls his wife's name Eve, Hawa, Hawan in them heart, because she was the mother of all living. How could she be the mother of all living? That's my question. How could she be the mother of all living? Let's go to the Hebrew right here, quickly right here. It says, Wayikra ha Adam. And he called ha Adam, and the Adam called Shem, right? Ishto. Ishto or Seto or Esheto, but he appointed as Ishto is Isha Chawa, Chawa, Ki, because he, he in the Hebrew pronoun for she, Haita, right? She be, she become, she be. Aim, aim is mother, aim, call Chai. She be the aim, call Chai. This is to show that the deception that occurred was in full effect, right? In full effect, they were in the beginning of the consequences. This is the first act, right, of the fallen consciousness that he called the woman that in the chapter before, he says, you shall be known as Isha, woman, because you came out of Ish. He didn't name her Adama because he came from the ground. Right? The reddish brown ground. But his mother, Adam's mother, was the Adama. But he calls her Isha. And he says because she was brought forth out of Ish. So he identifies himself as Ish. Not to go too far ahead, but in the Hebrew sense, Ish is the higher man. There's verses in the scripture where it says both low and high all together, calling all into witness. Even the psalm that says calling all to witness, both low and high all together. In the Hebrew, the low man or the common man, the basic man is known as Adam, B'nai Adam, the children of Adam or the sons of Adam. And the higher man is known as B'nai Ish, B'nai Ish. So there's more than one terminology that generally is translated as man. So in the chapter before the eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of Tob Wera, Tob Vera, Tob Wera, Tob good, Tawab the beneficial, and Ra'a, the evil, the hurtful, the harmful, the bad, right? We could say the adverse. So before they ate of this tree or the fruit of the tree of the knowledge, they were in a state by the text and by the narrative that we can say, remember there's a formula here, these parables, these mashallah formulas here, and there's a lot that was embedded in these formulas. 
So before the consequences, in other words, man was created, and on the day he's created in the first chapter, right, male and female, he created them. They were they were tov me'od, tov me'od. They were very good, much good, enough good, very beneficial, very good. There's no hint of ra'a, ra, ra in the Hebrew term for evil, hurtful, harmful, bad. There's, there's no idea. Now, after he eats right, of the fruit, now remember, he was the one that was told. The woman was not even there, right? The, the Isha, the woman, the Hawa, she was not even there. Now, we could say that she was there in his chromosomes, right? Of his X and Y male chromosome and XX. It only goes to figure that the distinction between XY, right, and XX is that Y. You want to ask why? Is that Y? So the XX, right? So that bone that was taken out, that rib, allegedly, when it says rib, that translation of it, that's the King James Version. And as you look in the Hebrew sense, it's not a far leap at all. In fact, it's the logical conclusion that we're talking about DNA, right? We're talking about genetics. Something genetical is being described here, right, in the first book that's ascribed to Moshe, right? But then when we get to chapter 3, verse 20, right, the man now says that this woman that he said before, right, is his it's his feminine counterpart because she was brought out of him now after he has violated what he was not to do right and the violation now is the consequences so if you're created and according to the narrative the text you're very good right then the only thing you can introduce by a knowledge of good and evil is the evil or the adverse to the good. You know what I mean? The adverse to the good. So it's almost like if there was only daytime and no nighttime, and then you eat of the tree of day and night, then you're going to now experience nighttime, right? And also you might experience a twilight zone. This is a twilight zone right here. You know, the twilight is between the day and between the night. This is this verse here. This is this area of scripture right here. This is the part that people overlook, right? And they misinterpret. They say, well, she was the mother of all living. Look at that. Look at the man. Look at Adam. He called her mother of all. But how is she mother of all living? Right? See, the logical conclusion is that she was not really the mother of all living, but Adam, right? Post, right? Post tree of the knowledge of good and evil syndrome, trauma experiencing Adam. This is what he says. See, remember the woman, the woman a couple of verses earlier? What did the woman say? The woman said this right here. The woman said this right here. Notice the woman's answer. We're going to just compare two answers right here. Adam why right, he said that he heard his voice and he hid himself because he was naked and you know and, and that's why he hid himself. He was afraid, right? And 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 naked, so he hid himself. So then he, Yahweh Elohim, right, said to him, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Now that's a fair question. According to the text, we don't see anybody told him that he was naked. He must have got that knowledge for himself, right? After he ate of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Before that, there wasn't a problem. There was not a shame. It says, hast thou eaten of the tree? Remember, there was two trees. I just want to point that out. People often miss that too, right? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now, the thou there is you male, not you all, not ye, not y'all. Right? Remember, Adam in chapter 2 was told directly, him, male, singular. It's singular in the, in, the, in the Hebrew linguistics when we get to the source code. Now notice, and the man said, now the man responding to the question of Yahweh Elohim, what does the man say? The man, right, or the Adam, right, he said the woman, the woman or the Isha, Right, the Eshet, the Oset, whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me. 
of the tree and I did eat. Now that's generally true, but do you get what's going on in this verse right here, verse 12? That the man now is blaming his benefactor, Yahweh Elohim, who brought the woman to him and gave the woman to be with him. Remember when the woman was with him? He was very excited. He said, you are Isha because you came from Ish. You know what I mean? And they both were naked and they were not ashamed. I mean, is there a shame? Should it be a shame? We know shame and nakedness today, but then we know there's many even tribes and peoples who don't think or feel that way. Could it be that they're not fallen in that level of their consciousness? Some people really believe that, you know, nakedness is really a, a big, a big shame. I'm not saying that people should walk around naked, but I'm saying that why do we think this? And why didn't he think this before he ate of this tree? Now, Overall, there's a good to eating of that tree, ultimately speaking, right? But in the context of what the narrative is teaching us, it's trying to teach us something, not just to point fingers, but to learn something. You see, the so-called mythology, people talk about, oh, this is just a myth. Mythology is primitive sociology. Let me say that once again. Mythology, ancient mythology was primitive sociology. It's how they coded and embedded truths. You have to have the code to interpret it, right? And apply it with what we call the real world or real world science. So when it says that she gave me of the tree and I did eat, what he's doing is blaming. He's blaming Yahweh Elohim. Remember, this is after he eats of this tree. I don't know if you can notice his, his psychology. If we were to psychoanalyze Adam just from the narrative, his psychology changes before he eats and after he eats. But that's not the only change. Remember, the knowledge means that you need experience. To, know, to really know something, you need that experiential knowledge. And this is the beginning, even right here, of the experiential knowledge. She gave me of the tree and I did eat. And Yahuwah Elohim said to the woman, what is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, he asked her one question. Notice with Adam, he asked him, he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? One question. Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? So he actually asked him two questions there. But then notice this right here. In verse 9, he asked him, the first question was, where art thou? Right, so there's three questions he asked the man, right? Because if you know anything about male and female, sometimes you got to ask the male more questions. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But anyway, the woman, right? She goes and she answered, "The serpent beguiled me. The nachash beguiled me. Now beguiled me. Something that now she gains great wisdom." I think that this is what humanity began to think with the rise, the fall of the of the of 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 man. What it was it was a fall of the balance between male and female. That's what fell here. It was a fall of the balance between male and female. So the fall of man is the fall of the balance. But that fall of the balance means that the other scale is going to rise, therefore the rise of the matriarchy after the beginning. That's the key. So here we have nasha. Nasha here in the Hebrew means to beguile, to deceive, to beguile, right? Utterly, like truly, completely, to be led. Look what it says. Strong's definition says the primitive root. So when the woman says, according to King James Version, that the serpent, the nachash, beguiled me, she's saying he led me astray. That is, you see what it says, mentally to delude or morally to seduce. But the general way this word is translated elsewhere in the King James Version is beguile, deceive, like to deceive greatly, to beguile utterly, like completely. Like, you know, when somebody says, you, you made a real fool out of me. That's what she's saying, that the serpent made a real fool out of me and I did eat, right? Now we go through the consequences. The only one that was cursed in this whole narrative was the Nahash, the serpent, right? What was said to the woman might was what consequences now that you want the knowledge of good it's good to have a child right but now you also going to suffer the consequences it's like this in many hospital situations right don't they apply anesthesia isn't sometimes anesthesia applied right or other kind of quote painkillers 
but now there will be no painkiller. See, the painkiller, right? Basically, if you go to the hospital or have a medical procedure done and they apply painkillers, it's so you don't feel the pain. The pain is there, but the painkiller is applied so you don't feel any pain. So this area of the scripture to say, now the painkiller, you're going you're gonna to experience the real situation, the full situation. You know what I mean? It's like somebody says, you want the painkiller? And they're like, no, I want to feel it. Sometimes people do want to feel it, right? And so what is being said here, the woman is not being cursed, right? She is being um, informed that now that you have, you know, which door do you choose? You've chosen that door. So you got to go through that door. But let me tell you, here's your consolation prize. Here is the results Right, the initial and the lasting results of what has happened. Now, this doesn't mean that all women suffer the same amount of sorrow and pain in conception, right? But it does mean that this, according to the narrative, was introduced as one of the first results, one of the lasting results of the action that was so taken. Now, when it says, Thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Here's another area that many people mis misinterpret and misunderstand. They say, oh, look, that's the patriarchy right there. No, 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 you're misunderstanding it. See, the man was there in the garden, given the rules and the regulation before the woman was presented. That means that he was given the instructions. He was given the command. Even when Eve answered the serpent and she said not to eat of it and don't touch of it, you go back to what was told to Adam. There's no don't touch of it. So either she made this up of her own or either Adam in a kind of desire to protect her, he added this. We don't know how it was, but what we know is that she wasn't there to get the original, you know what I mean? You know, the original command. He was first on the job, right? But in the scene with the Nahash, she took, like when when the serpent said, half not God said you can't eat of any tree of the garden? He's saying basically, has God said to starve you? Elohim said to starve you? He exaggerated the question, knowing full well. Who answered first? It was the woman. She was wrong in her answer. Did not Adam know way? Elohim, Yahweh Elohim didn't, didn't say don't touch it. He didn't say that. At no point does he say anything and he is right there. You see? And she took it on herself, right, to respond. It's like sometimes we respond from our emotions, right? You know, like, like our emotional, our soul aspect. Sometimes we have to, you know, the spirit has to counsel the soul. Right? Because if we just follow our feelings, you know how feelings sometimes, you know, can become addictive in itself. So she had a desire to do this, but he did not exercise his role. Like, any of you ever been in a male female situation where the woman might do something and the man act like, well, I knew this would happen in a sense? And the woman is very upset. Like, well, if you knew this would happen, why didn't you say anything? And the man is like, whoa, you decided, like, because you started to talk first, I just let you talk. And like, so you basically allowed me to get in trouble. You allow me to see this is what's going on here. I want you to understand. And it's because the man, the Adam, should have been the one to check the serpent on what he said about what Jehovah, the, he didn't even say Jehovah, the serpent didn't even say Yahweh. So the serpent disrespected my, you know, Hashem from the get and then he tried to insinuate that Hashem wanted them to starve in the garden then the woman answers and she gives an incomplete you know response she give a she adds erroneous data that the Elo Yahweh Elohim didn't say and as she as the conversation continues Adam is just standing there Right? He's just observing this. He does not speak. So when it says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, her desire became to the serpent and what the serpent was beguiling her in. Right? And when it says, he shall rule over thee, right? the word here is mashal. Mashal is an interesting word. It means to rule, to have dominion, to exercise rule. Right? But we have another word that's very close to this word. And the word that's very close to this word is known as, as mashal. And mashal is a parable. 
let's just do this right here for all ones and ones to see right here let's go through this like this and let's scroll down what verse was this in the mashal and he shall rule over these verse 16 right so in verse 16 right here let's click on rule right here and now we're going to select the word mashal you see the word mashal let's scroll up and down oh there's another word mashal oh look there's mashal my mashal here means to represent, to liken, to be like, to be similar. Furthermore, it's to speak in proverb, speak in similitudes, using like a metaphorical, like a, a figurative example, speak in parables, speak in sentences of poetry, like rhymes or you could say riddles. But the direct is an allegory. What does it say right here? To liken, that is, use figurative language, an allegory. People say, oh, the Bible is full of allegories. Well, look at this first of all the allegories, right? So notice when it says right there, in the text, it says, so we have two words here. We have mashal, the, the H4911, and then we have the H4910. If we go further, it goes out of that. If we go further this way, we have another mashal. Mashal, as a noun, is a proverb, a mashal. It's a byword. It's a similitude, a parable, right? poem, sentences of ethical wisdom, ethical maxim, right? So we have right here it says apparently from the H4910, remember that's what we started out to rule over in some original sense of superiority of mental action, right? In a sense, the man had a superiority of mental action, but he did not exercise. You know the old saying, if you don't use it, you lose it, so to speak. Properly a pithy maxim, usually a metaphor of a metaphorical nature. Hence, a simile as an adage, a poem, a discourse, right? A byword, something would it be like, a parable, a proverb, right? So when it's saying that the man shall rule over, and we have another mashal, right? We have mashal here, right? And this is a place name, a person's name, mashal. So I point this out, right? And then there's mishal. Mishal is a byword, mishal. Right, me shall no uh, no, and then we have Moshel. A Moshel is dominion. Notice the word Moshel. All this is coming from, you know, this root. When it says that you shall, he shall have dominion. He shall be that likeness, the one who is like the similitude, because he was given the direct command, right, from Hilahim. And when this test went on, he did not check it. He did not check the Nachash, and he did not even check the woman and say, uh uh uh. Honey, honey, baby, like, no, um, Yahuwah Elohim didn't say that. What he said was, you know what I mean? But instead, he just stands there by. So notice that this was said to the woman. It wasn't said to the man, oh, her desire going to be to you. You her husband and you rule over. Notice, he said that to the woman, not to the man. I want you to see how important that is. In other words, by saying that to the man, it was saying that you better rule her. No. This was said to the woman, right? Because the woman should allow him to be first up, right? And take that, take that, take that rule. He should have ruled in that situation. He should have overruled the serpent when the serpent disrespected Yahweh, right? He said Elohim, right? If you notice, he changed up. He takes off the Hashem, right? He plays games. And then the woman, she steps into that game. And from her first statement, she's off. The man doesn't say anything. And then it says, and to Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, Ishtaka, right? He's listened to the voice of his wife and has eaten of the tree, right? So he heard the conversation with his wife, right? And now he's eaten of the tree that he was commanded, that I commanded thee saying, thou should not eat of it. See, he didn't say it to the woman not to eat of it. So the consequences on the man, the male, and the consequence on the woman cannot be the same, right? And we're not the same. That's why I say it's the fall of man and the rise of the matriarchy. So what was curse? Was Adam cursed? No, he says, curse is the ground for your sake. You know what? I'm going to take this out on this because of you. I'm not going to take this out on you because of you. But this is important to you, so I'm going to make that rough to get back at you, but I'm not directly going to curse you, right? But you, your consequences, the consequences of what you did, because remember, Adam, right, 
Adam came from the Adama. That's why the word for ground is Adama. Are you peeping something here? Adam, Adama. But see, you won't know that in the King James Version because you see ground. But the Hebrew says Adama. So you have Adam came from the Adama. Like equals like, right? And so it says, because it says, um, for thy sake in sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat herb of the field, right? In the sweat. Now notice how many verses are going into Adam's consequence. Remember how many questions were there? There were three questions. How many verses are addressed to Adam? Three verses. The third verse, in the sweat of your face, thou shalt eat bread. Did he have sweat of his face in the in the gan, the, the genet, the garden? No. Till thou return to the ground, the ground, till you return to the Adama. The Adama. You see what it says Adama? Now Adama in ancient Kemet would be the Kemet. In Mitzrayim, the Kemet is that dark, reddish, black, brown, rich, no, nutrient-rich, agricultural, you know, <laughs> um, ground, the ground, the land, right? So it says, you return to the Adama. So you turn to Adam and saying to Adam, you're going to return to the Adama for out of it, or really out of what? Is it it? Is it it he or is it it she? It's a noun feminine. You see right there? It says the soil from the general redness Right? For you shall return to her. Right? For out of it you was taken. For dust thou art for Afar. The Afar. Remember the Ethiopian ancient people, the Afar people? For Afar thou art, and to Afar, right, to dust, right, you shall thou return. Right? So now notice what happens in the next verse. The next verse says right here, right? And Adam called his wife's name Eve. Now, make that make sense right there. Based on the narrative that precedes it, right? How does it make sense that after all that has been said, the curse of the Nahash, the serpent, the Ibab, the consequences on the woman, notice what the consequences, it had to do with childbirth. Now that brings in the matriarchy. I'm going to show you, prove that right, right now. And then the consequence upon Adam with the ground. Then after all that was said, Adam says, right, he calls his wife's name. Now he gives her a Shem. Remember the Shem? The Shem is the name. He gives us the Shem, the name, the fame, the reputation, the name. We say the Hashem for the name of the Almighty, Yahweh, right? But the Shem is the name, right? He gives her a name. Now notice what the name means. It says, um, through the idea of definite and conspicuous position, right? Compare an appellation, a mark of memorial of individuality. He's saying that Hawa, she stands out here. By implication, it's honor. It's honor, authority, character. Remember, she said that the serpent beguiled me, right? But Adam was told not to eat, that's why I said the consequences on both of them were different. As we say, man and woman are different. This is the original sense that has been lost in counterfeit Christianity. Now, let's pause right here for a moment and give this proof right here. Now, we begin off this still. I don't know who does this, but give thanks for this particular work because it really shows, you know, what we would like to show right here. Let's show this right here just to prove this. Let's go back to the Bronze Age. Right? The Bronze Age cultures. Right? right? The Bronze Age cultures. What do we find in the Bronze Age culture? Let's zoom in. We find the matriarchy. Right? All throughout the ancient cultures, we find the matriarchy. Look, is this woman clothed? It's like she may have some panties on. But basically this, um, you know, whichever one of their goddesses is. This. So in a sense, it's like how a Eve... Right? By virtue of the mashal, the mishal, the parable, she becomes the quintessential goddess. Notice each one of these are goddesses here. So you're going to tell me the matriarchy was not ruling right after the fall of man, the fall of Adam? Basically, after Genesis chapter 3, according to the Hebrew narrative, there is the matriarchy. It points to the matriarchy. In other words, mama's baby, father's maybe. I didn't even go to chapter four where Adam knows his wife, right? And she conceived and she gave birth to Ai and to Cain, 
right? The murderer from the beginning. But notice what she does. When Cain is born, she calls on the name of Yahweh, right? She said, Yahweh has given me this one. But that one proved to be evil. She calls out the good name, the Hashem, upon the evil one. And Abel comes along and she says nothing about him. Remember, and Abel becomes that kind of Osiren figure because remember, after Cain killed him in a kind of a kind of a, a Sethian fashion, right? After he kills him, right, he seeks to bury his body in the ground, but his blood is talking. So he's dead, but his blood is speaking from where? From the ground, from below the ground. Where was it? How did the Egyptians do it? They talk about the Lord of the underworld, right? The underground, right? Notice. Abel's, Abel's blood was speaking, right, from the ground. I'm still saying that these are even the Hebrew ancient tales that correspond with the truth of ancient archaeology that we're able to find. What about over in this culture over here? It is the goddess, right? Notice that the rest of them, the men seem like they are fully clothed. The woman is not. Right? And if we get deeper into the culture, we'll see more of it. So we have the goddesses. So the goddesses were ruling for a long time. And here's what I have to say. Notice her, she's holding her, her, her sacred area, right? She, she, she's gesturing to it. See, the ancient, we said the mythology, ancient mythology is primitive sociology, right? People are reading it like it's a comic book or a cartoon. That's not how they, they may have drawn it in sort of cartoonish characters and ways, but you have to have the code. To understand what really was going on. Look as we look at all these ages. We get to the late Bronze Age, right? We see the matriarchy all over the place. Look at the look at the Iron Age, right? The Iron Age. Now in the Iron Age, you see the matriarchy. Let's zoom in in case ones can't see it for themselves. It might be small. You see, these are the goddesses, right? And then when we see how important these goddesses were, right? And then you can also see the motif of the mother and child. You see the mother and child motif, right? As we have more time, we'll go into the same verse where the consequences is being proclaimed to Eve and it's connected, right? Even that word sorrow has another implication of the mother and child, even within the so-called idols and ideological sense of even the ancient idolatries, the ideologies, the ideologies conveyed their, you know, the idolatry conveyed their ideologies. You see what I'm saying? It wasn't just like they did this on Sunday or Saturday or Friday. No, this was how they lived day in and day out, right? But it was deeper than just thinking of this in a cartoon level. So it was the goddesses that ruled, right? It was the, so when Adam says concerning his, his Isha, his wife, after all that happens in Bereshith, right, chapter Gimel, Gamel, the third chapter, you see, she was a goddess. He was a fallen man. I want you to note that right there. Even notice with the very beginning. And then we look at the ancient typology, the Cain, the Abel, Right, even you can see even the the psychology of the Seth and the Osar, the Yisser, the Wisser, right? The the Set, right? And the Wisser, Yisser, Yisser, Yes Sir. That they could say Osar, right? So we're saying that when we're looking at it from the correct point of view, right? From the correct point of view, and people say, well, if that was so, why didn't God do anything? God did do something. He talked to wisdom, right? He said that the man, notice what he said, the man has become as one of us. Notice that there wasn't the reference to the woman right there, right? Because who was responsible, right? It was the man that was responsible. So the, the fatherhood, right? The fatherhood was not known, and you can study ancient cultures, and, you, and this, this is proven by studying ancient cultures. It's like the old time saying that my Geechee Gullah people would say down in the Carolina and Sea Island, they say, mama's baby, papa's maybe, right? In other words, it was about the mother and the son, the mother and the child, namely the mother and the son. So it's true what many have spoken about matriarchy, 
But what is not true is that the patriarchy didn't even come into view until late. In ancient Egypt, it's the rise of the cult of, of Re, of Re that they call Ra, of Re, right? That represents the, the rise of the father God, the father nature, right? In ancient Mitzrayim. But before that, we have the evidence of the ruling of the matriarchy, right? I'm talking about within their politics, in their government, in their spirituality, in all the nine plus areas of people activity, right? And in the biblical sense, the rise of the righteous patriarchy is linked with Abraham, right? So we have in ancient Egypt, the Re, when, when the cult of Ra and Re becomes predominant in ancient Egypt, some say roughly around, um, I think maybe some say the second, it all depends on the different, you know, Egyptologists, right? But when it becomes um, in force, Right, more and more, this was the attempt to balance the equation. Then we can see the role of the of the patriarchy. But even then, the patriarchy was greatly subordinate, right, to the matriarchy, right. And even today, I submit to you that Babylon, as we say, Babylon, right, is a matriarchy. Now, people say, but there is the 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 patriarchy, right? What about the white patriarchy? Have you noticed this? That even among the Europeans, right, the mother influence, you ever see like the gangster movies, the Italian gangster movies, the mother is very influential. Even among some of the European, the Jews and other European kind of groups, the woman is, the mother has a very strong influence, right, the matriarch, you know, we're watching this Jeffrey Dahmer thing and need I say any more, you know, <laughs> the matriarch, but it matters what your mother is. Right. And in the ancient world, the matriarchy was ruling. Right. But the matriarchy was not always ruling. There's the good and the beautiful that people try to tell you about. Oh, the mother and the mother is the first and the mother is our mother. Yes. But they don't tell you about the bad and ugly. After all, when humanity decided, according to the Hebrew mythos, to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that means we got to deal with it both. Good over evil, yes, but we can't ignore the bad and the ugly. And it was the bad and the ugly, right, within the matriarchy, right, that in a sense caused its, we could say, the change of it and the overt demise of it. So overtly, the matriarchy is covered up. But in effect, the matriarchy, right, one of the two poles of the reality it just so happened that after the Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, the man fell, right? The man fell, and we could say the matriarchy rose. And that's testified in all of these ancient, you know, these ancient um, archaeology, right? Testifies to it. Anyway, a little bit more on this, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, right here, here, here. You know, we're going to bring forward, we could bring forward, we'd like to bring forward some proofs, you know, from different, you know, from different um, perspective that will bring out the truths, right, that we're pointing to here, even within this biblical, in the biblical narrative. We're saying that the ancient Hebrews and writers of the Bible and the Hebrew mythos understood this. However, this has um, been lost, right, in counterfeit Christianity and in, you know, the Anglo-American superimposition of their the whitewashing of Christianity and the bastardization. You know, that's a counterfeit. Anyway, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers, Shalom Chabarim, Shalom. What you think about this? The fall of the fall of man, right? The rise of the matriarchy, right? From Genesis chapter three and forward.